Arles. French is easy. All right, artistic breakthroughs. Van Gogh went to Arles because he was ill. He was sick in Paris. He'd hit the sauce too hard. He drank too much French wine. And he also caught the smoker's cough. That's at least what the internet tells me. So I will be talking about that today. And really what I also wanna talk about is the incredible stylistic evolution Van Gogh's work took on in Arles. And maybe more importantly, what we can learn from the radical transformation Van Gogh's art underwent while he was in Arles. I'm gonna ask some questions. How can we put ourselves in a better position to create great creative works? How can we put ourselves in a better position to achieve our goals and actualize our full potential? How can we become better creators, whether we're talking about YouTube videos or paintings or novels or animations? Whatever. I am asking how. But first, we have to set the stage. So Van Gogh was ill from drink. That sauce. And he did what everyone does when they've been off the wagon too long. He relocated, he uprooted, and he moved to the French countryside, which is what everyone does. And it was in the French countryside, in a little town called Arles, that Van Gogh got healthy for a very, very brief amount of time. But he got healthy, nevertheless. So, Van Gogh got over his illness from the liquor. The tar deposits in his lungs, which made breathing almost impossible, disappeared, or they healed. Or they at least got a little bit better. I don't actually know about the tar deposits. Details like this don't matter. And if you think that details like this matter for any reason other than, you know, like your own interest, then I am not sure that I can save you. So anyways, Van Gogh went to Arles, and while he was there, one of the most prolific periods of his lifetime took place. He snapped on him. What I'm saying is in the 14 months Van Gogh was in Arles, he completed 200 paintings and more than 100 drawings and watercolors, which is a lot. Those are incredible numbers. They are goofy numbers. I can just imagine Van Gogh getting his little bunch of supplies together, carrying his canvas outside into the sunlight, and then he would just paint. And he would do that all day. And that's basically the only way that you can produce 200 paintings with an additional 100 drawings in 14 months. It's crazy. He didn't have to, you know, spend all day locked up in his dark and cavernous Kafka-esque bedroom staring at an almost uh, impossibly bright computer screen until his dry and damaged eyes felt as though they were about to roll out of the front of his face. Van Gogh didn't have to do anything like that to create his art. He got to work outside in the sunshine and listen to the French birds. So I know what you're probably thinking. Wow, everything in Van Gogh's life was perfect. And it was perfect. He was in the French countryside. His mysterious liquor-borne illness was lifting. His smoker's cough was fading. He was outside and he was painting. Just kidding. <laughs> everything in Van Gogh's life was actually not perfect. Despite the fact that he was able to work outside, the reality was that Van Gogh, like so many before him, and like so many after him, could not escape from himself by traveling to a new place. Remember that. He arrived at Arles in late February of 1888, and before Christmas of that very same year, he checked himself in to an asylum after sawing his own ear off with a razor blade. So there you have it. Things for Van Gogh weren't perfect, but he did get to work outside on sunny days. And all I'm saying is that that has to count for something. 
Okay, so that was a quick overview of Van Gogh's time in Arles because after sawing his own ear off, he went into an asylum. And then after he left the asylum, he went to a new place. What I think is most important though, is not the timeline, but rather the fact that Van Gogh is working like an absolute horse. His content production was through the roof. And although he only ever sold one painting during his lifetime, which is called the Red Vineyard, uh, which is something I have made a video about in the past. It was here in Arles that he painted it, the Red Vineyard. But more than even that, it was in Arles that Van Gogh's style changed forever. It was in Arles that his style, in hindsight, took on a radical transformation. And this is what we're going to talk about for the rest of the video. Okay, if you look if you look here when Van Gogh first started painting in 1881, you then you can clearly see that in the beginning when he did first start painting that his art was this way. And then if we go forward just a little bit just a little bit uh, we're in 1885 now, we need 1888, we're almost, we're getting closer, uh, close, oh, there, there we go, okay. To here, we can see that this is, it's like completely different uh, if we compare 1881 to 1888. But okay, how did this happen? To put it in boring art nerd terms, Van Gogh developed an expressive, and unique painting style that is characterized by bold colors and dynamic brush strokes. And there are theorists who like to point their bony and decrepit fingers at the correlation between Van Gogh's stylistic developments and his decaying mental health. But correlation, my dear viewer, does not prove causation. Some people would even go as far as to say that not only does correlation not prove causation, but nothing proves causation. We all know who these people are. We've met these people, these crazy people. Anyways, what was going on with Vincent van Gogh? He might not have even have cut his ear off. There's this huge debate that artners have. Did van Gogh really saw his entire ear off? Or was it just a portion? What was the weight of the chunk that he cut off? That's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering how heavy it was, but I don't know. And neither do any of these people who are talking. We weren't there, I wasn't there. And this is why facts don't matter. So like I was saying, expressive and unique painting style characterized by bold colors, dynamic brush strokes that are both thick and also heavy. Articles on the internet say Van Gogh started painting from memory in Arles. And what that did is it made his paintings less realistic, but more attractive. And this is how the style we recognize as characteristically Van Gogh began to take place. Van Gogh began using color and brush strokes to communicate the emotions he associated with his subjects. For example, here is a chubby and turquoise baby. Look at the way this baby is, so cute. But why is it a turquoise baby? While it may be cute, it sure isn't realistic. And this brings us to an idea that art nerds, I'm talking about the art nerds again, that the art nerds love to swoon over. The idea that colors can be used to communicate emotion. emotion. Rather than using more traditional and realistic painting techniques, Van Gogh let the colors do the talking. Was Van Gogh the first person to ever do this? Was he the only one doing it at the time? I think the answer to both of these questions is probably not. Probably there were plenty of other artists who associated colors with emotion. emotion. I don't understand how this is actually a debate. For example, how long have the sad been feeling blue? How long have the angry seen red? Nobody knows, but I'm telling you that this is how Van Gogh's story goes. It is clean and it is 
easily decipherable and easy to understand and it can be fully grasped and fully communicated within the parameters of a single YouTube video. It's a very big deal, this idea of using color to capture emotion or atmosphere. But in all seriousness, I think people probably just like Van Gogh's paintings a lot, so much, in fact, that they exaggerate the truth, either consciously or unconsciously, in order to get other people to listen and to maybe care as much about Van Gogh's art as they do. So that's a game we're playing with the internet. What do you want? You want things fast? Well, you are in luck because you can get them fast. Your wish is granted, but the only downside is that most of the time, nobody except for the author, the creator, the writer is going to proofread the material. But on the bright side, now you can get barely average information as fast as you can move your thumbs. So I ask you to please not shoot the messenger. Open your eyes and see this wasteland for what it is and for what it has always been. Pure chaos. That's right, everything that's happening in the present is pure chaos and if we pay too much attention to it, it will consume us and there will be no escape short of death. But the question does still remain, what can someone who's interested learn from this period of Van Gogh's life? From February 1888 to May of 1889. Well, I'll tell you. And here's a take that you're not going to get anywhere else. These are my words, no one else's. I will cover what is perhaps most obvious first. From Van Gogh, there's something to be learned about the relationship between brilliance and madness. The relationship that brilliance and madness often share. This idea is interesting. It is compelling. It's very cool, but it's more trendy than it is cool. And it is admittedly pretty cool. It's like the whole rock star, self-destructive artist thing. And, you know, talking like that makes me think, you know, what human being doesn't love uh, uh, a pretty dumpster fire. But listen, dear viewer, I'm like telling you that it's also big cringe to admire the self-destructive artist for being self-destructive. I think they're great artists as far back as anyone is willing to look. And I agree that many of them were weird and or terrible people with habits that destroyed them. But there were also plenty who did not destroy themselves. Van Gogh sawed his ear off with a razor blade. I don't know anything about that sort of thing. So I've picked something else entirely to tell you what I think we can learn from. What can we learn from the work that Van Gogh produced during his time in Arles from February 1888 to May 1889. So here's what I think is the biggest takeaway from Van Gogh's time in Arles, the relationship between consistently average quality, extreme quantity, and mastery slash proficiency. Okay, so let's talk about that relationship between consistently average quality, extreme quantity, and mastery. People like to say that quality beats quantity, and probably that's true, but it also isn't always true, because really what I think the process of improvement, of proficiency, of mastery, whatever the word you want to use is, what I think it's about is practice. It's about reps. It's about showing up every day and doing the work, even when you hate yourself and want to die. In 14 months, Van Gogh cranked out 200 paintings and 100 drawings and watercolors. That is a lot. It's like 25% of all the work he produced during his lifetime. He did all of that work and he also made no money. Was Van Gogh a great artist? I think most people will agree with me when I say yes, he was. Was Van Gogh a mad genius? It would appear so, but as far as what the root cause of his 
like cultural relevance is primarily owed to, I'll repeat myself, Van Gogh worked like a horse and probably that seems obvious, but so what? If I have to risk sounding cringe to make people forget about the sweet appeal of Van Gogh's madness as an explanation, then so be it. Occam's razor, that's what I'm talking about right now. So the reality, as I see it, is that most notoriously great artists work like horses. Van Gogh did this, Monet did this, Picasso did this, Warhol did this. Those are the first four artists that pop to mind. They're all like painter guys, but other artists too. I could name writers. I won't because this video is getting long, but all artists, all creators, anybody who does anything, if you want to do big things, work like a horse. So remember this, there is no such thing as perfection. Just make stuff, just start doing stuff. You might not end up producing culturally relevant art, although I hope that you will. But if you care enough and if you work hard enough, maybe you can make a little something something happen on the side. And that's no joke, the internet is a big place. Trillions of dollars are exchanged every day. If you work like a horse at something that you really love deeply, maybe you can siphon off a couple of bucks for yourself. I'm telling you to get started. I'm telling you to work hard. I'm telling you that the first step to being great at anything is sucking. So don't give up. Don't be afraid to be bad. Just try to do your best. And don't forget to smash like, slap sub, and say hello in the comments. Thank you for watching. I will see you next time.